If you are starting a vertical farm and don't know where to begin or which technology would suit your needs, then reach out to the experts at Cultivated. As indoor farm brokers, they help connect you to the right technology and ensure your project is successful. Best of all, their service is free because they work on behalf of their partners. Visit Cultivated.com to learn more. And that's spelled C-U-L-T-I-V-A-T-D.com or click the link in the show notes. A lot of our competitors, you know, were selling a lighting product. Others are just doing lab work. Others are just doing sensory work. We've got all of those under one roof where we manufacture our product, we design our own product, and create that long-term partnership with you. We're there for the next 20, 30, 40 years. Welcome to the Vertical Farming Podcast, weekly conversations with fascinating CEOs, founders, and ad tech visionaries. Join us every week as we dive deep into the world of vertical farming with your host, Harry Duran. Vertical Farming Podcast, Season 4. Welcome back. If this is your first time listening, you're in the right place. This is the show where we interview fascinating CEOs and founders of the leading vertical farming companies from around the world. I'm your host, Harry Duran. In case you missed last week's episode, we had a really, really good conversation with Matt Ryan. He's the CEO at Solely Organic, formerly known as Shenandoah Growers. It's a name inspired by their start in Virginia's Shenandoah Valley. Solely grows exceptional organic produce at an affordable price nationwide. And we dove deep into Matt's incredible business background from working at Disney and Starbucks to eventually pursuing the exciting opportunity at Solely Organic. If you haven't listened to it, I highly recommend you check it out. This week, another fascinating conversation. This time it's with Simon Deacon. He's the founder and CEO of Light Science Technologies. It's a company that's passionate about delivering lighting, science, and research-proven plant monitoring solutions that helps growers grow more with less. A dynamic and forward-looking entrepreneur, Simon has founded and grown businesses in the LED space. And in this episode, we discuss the intricate and exciting work Simon is doing to disrupt the vertical farming industry. He talks in-depth about his lighting experience, the research Light Science Technologies does, and how the future includes exciting developments in sensor technology and AI. Simon speaks to how Light Science Technologies differentiates themselves from their competitors the impact supply chain issues have had on his business, now they're approaching customer relations through the lens of win-win partnerships. Quick reminder, if you are enjoying this episode or past episodes, I'd love it if you leave a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash VFP. Regular listeners will no doubt realize that there was a whole slew of reviews that got read out on last week's episode. There was some catching up that I needed to do. So make sure if you want yours read out, then go to ratethispodcast.com forward slash VFP. Given the growing popularity of the show, sponsorship slots are getting confirmed for season five. If you have an interest or your company has an interest in sponsoring the show, feel free to send me an email at harry at verticalfarmingpodcast.com. Okay, let's get into this conversation with Simon. So Simon Deacon, CEO of Light Science Technologies, thank you for joining me on the Vertical Farming Podcast. Thank you, Harry. It's good to be here. So... Where are you dialing in from? I'm dialing in from the UK. Um, we're based in, in Derbyshire in, in the UK. I say dialing in because I grew up in the 80s and I just realized I don't know how many people actually have a copper line still going to there. <laughs> <laughs> not so many these days, not so many. It's all new to technology. Do you still remember your home phone number growing up? I do, yes. Yeah, st- I, still, I still remember it. And I still remember the old ringtone as you used to. So you put your finger into the number and you have to actually dial it around. And it used to be very slim. <laughs> and you would have to get a really, really long cord if you wanted to speak, if you wanted to take it to another room. Oh, gosh, yeah. That, normally you'd go to the phone. You wouldn't take it to, take it anywhere. You'd have to go to the corner of the room where the, the phone used to be situated. Yeah. So, yeah, the days have changed drastically. And um, hopefully for the better. Yeah, that's true. I'm curious what, for folks that have never visited, what uh, life is like growing up in Derby. Uh, Derbyshire is uh, really nice. We're just on the edge of the Peak District, which is lots of countryside. So lots of uh, mountains, uh, lots of cycle, bicycle tracks uh, running, lots of sort of reservoirs in the area um, to go kayaking, um, which is really nice. Um, So lots of countryside, but then in Derby itself, there's big industrial. So Rolls-Royce, um, you would have heard of for aero, aero engines. Also Toyota uh, manufacture cars here. And also uh, we've got Bombardier who uh, make the uh, railway trains okay. around the world. Pretty global com- uh, companies as well as JCB. 
um, would dig a manufacturer. So yeah, global companies in Derby as well. So it's a good, good place to be based and, and a central point in England as well. And is that where you studied as well, university? Yeah, so uh, I grew up in Derbyshire and I did some studying down down in Warminster in Wiltshire and then moved back up to Derbyshire and went to, to Derby as well as Nottingham uh, College. So uh, that's where I did my education. And uh, then I started my business life very young, age of 19, um, nearly 30 years ago now. Um, I started my, my career and um, started in lighting, which was... Uh, where I, I am still today, but obviously the technology has grown tremendously over those 30 years from sort of fluorescent tubes to wound uh, chokes and starters to electronic ballasts and now to what we know and see in our homes, LEDs. So technology has really moved on and moved forward and very energy efficient. Do you remember the first dollar you earned? <laughs> um, yeah, in the days uh, gone by, the, 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 one of the lights that I, we were manufacturing and selling was um, to show if notes, uh, if you've got cash, dollars, pounds, um, to see if the notes were real or fake. Okay. And you would put it under what we called a blue-black light, and that was a fluorescent, small fluorescent tube uh, in a device which you would put the note under. And if the paper was incorrect, it showed up if it was fake or real. And I used to, to manufacture those and then sell them in bulk around the country to different retailers and outfits. And uh, that's how my, my first dollar was made. Do you have any exciting stories of, of working with uh, law enforcement to, to track down uh, or break up criminal rings? <laughs> no, we didn't get involved in the criminal part of it. I did end up with an awful lot of forged notes. Um, which you'd have to take to the station because when the retailer found out that they'd got all these notes, which they couldn't cash in, um, they ended up passing them to the person who was selling them the detecting device. Um, and of course, I didn't want them. So you'd either take them down to the local station or hand them into a bank who would destroy them. Can you recall when the early fascination, appreciation, interest in lighting started for you? I think it was at that point, because when I was buying com components back in, in the 90s, in the early 90s, where I was acquiring and purchasing the components, the company who I was acquiring them from was making low voltage for motorhomes, lighting for motorhomes, and what we have over here is caravans, etc. but also was making 230, 110 volt fittings. And so the fascination came really at that early stage and, and technology moves at a pace and seeing the technology move and expand made that we, we could move into different areas. We got heavily involved in, in a point of sale lighting over the years, commercial lighting for big factories and offices and malls and shopping malls. So our expansion happened very quickly as technology grew, and especially when the energy efficiency came through into electronics, electronic manufacture of ballast and drivers. And then obviously the gains started really coming in again with LEDs once the, the price point came down and, and they would go globally. So we would produce products to, to go global, but there wasn't a country that we didn't put our lighting into. If it be from China to America, it was worldwide. Um, and, and that was exciting. It was exciting to do the, the large projects that we did if it was for Xbox, Microsoft at the time, or uh, Nivea, you know, some of the brands um, that you might have heard of. So very exciting um, and fulfilling, really. You know, when you've got these big brands that you're doing and you're building a team to deliver a project of scale, it takes an awful lot of work and commitment. And building that team around you to deliver those projects was, was really exciting. I think it's interesting to see the history. And, and again, growing up in, in the 80s, you, you, know, you think of all the innovations that have been made in the field of lighting. Probably you know, one of the biggest ones is LEDs. But for someone who's been well-versed and steeped in, in lighting for so long, are there sort of milestone moments in lighting technology that you can recall? Yeah, I think definitely the, you know, as I mentioned, that to run a, a fluorescent tube, you would have a wound choke, which was copper being wound round, which was creates a choke. And that's what would run your the electricity would go through to run your fluorescent tube to spark up the gas within the fluorescent tube. 
And that's really quite old technology. You're burning this, this gas in a tube to move on to the more efficiency, a way of running from a fluorescent tube to an LED being so small. The diode used to be so small and, and today they're very difficult to see, but produces so much light. Um, quite fascinating how much uh, an LED produces and how much light and micromoles it produces. Um, and then obviously you can put different lenses on it um, to cover all sorts. But I think that's why we see the, the color changing on the outside of buildings, where we see internally lights that you can't see anymore. They're hidden within furniture, but they light up a room still. Um, and I think that's what, um, you know, has really shown the difference when you haven't got something clunky stuck to a ceiling or the outside of a building, it now concealed. Um, and I think that's the, the biggest change. Uh, we've seen and more widely available because obviously you can now run LEDs of battery. So where they haven't had electricity around the world and been using candles, they can use an LED powered off of, of a battery um, and then they can recharge battery on solar during the day. Um, so I think it's more accessible. Lights become more accessible around the world. Yeah, that's a good point. I, I'm noticing it firsthand. We recently upgraded our, our TV. That's a 50 inch TV. And I was very surprised at how light it was. <laughs> And, and the colors on it. And then the other thing that's been fun to play with is we received as a gift an LED light bulb that it connects to Wi-Fi. So <laughs> my partner is constantly dimming and increasing the light with her phone. So those two things have been top of mind uh, regarding lighting. It's been really fascinating to see. Yeah. So you've got, you've got devices which are talking to each other, which I think is pretty much everywhere now. You can you can, uh, you know, your washing machine, you can control by your phone or your TV or, or your lights outside. So I think everything's becoming more accessible and more exciting to use where you used to just switch on a light and it used to come on and that was the color of it. You can now change the color to the mood or if you're having a party or you're dining or you're having breakfast, you can change the mood within the room. And so, yeah, lighting's a big thing. And that's really how it's moved into agriculture as well, to grow plants in the controlled environment of agriculture has really changed everything in that space. So prior to light science, you, said, uh, you were at the chairman at UK Circuits and Electronics. Were you just, re I'm interested in the timing. First question is what, what's some of the, the projects you were working on there that stand out? And also as you were, is that around the time that you were also becoming aware of what's happening in this controlled uh, environment agriculture space? Yeah, so Light Science Technology Holdings has two companies within it. We've got the Light Science Technology Company, which is in providing technology into controlled environment um, to growing plants, if it be in glass houses, vertical farms, poly tunnels, or containers. We cover the whole enclosed environment with our technology. But UK Circuits is also within our own holding company in the group. And um, that manufactures is, is all electronic. So we manufacture up their lighting products, sensor products, and that company's been going over 24 years. Okay. Um, so it's a well-established company, and that's based up in, in Manchester in England and employs over 60 input and staff up there and is growing. So we're in all sorts of segments. So we do ECUs for cars, so car electronics, which is obviously really important now as we go more into electric cars going forward. But also sensor technology has come out there. We've done a lot of, a lot of sensor technology for oil and gas industry. And we've also manufactured an awful lot of lights for lighting uh, companies throughout Europe. Um, and out of that, we did... About three years ago now, we did our first vertical farm and produced a... a a bespoke light for that vertical farm. And that's really what we saw the, the initial thoughts of actually producing technology and using our 24 years of experience in other fields, but putting it into this new market, which is, is growing at over sort of 20 billion pounds over up to 2025. So it's a huge market to, to be involved in. And that's how light science technology came about out of UK circuits about three years ago, using the technology and experience of that team and building the team up within light science technology to then go into that market and create a product range of technology 
um, from lighting products. So we have over 44 different types of, of lighting that we use, but also we use sensor technology products to create a, so we can get the recipe. People talk about a recipe of light to grow plants, uh, which is obviously extremely important because there's lots of different species of plants um, around. There's over 3,000 different species of plants, but generally there's about a thousand that we might consume as humans to, to, to eat. And so it's creating the right recipe of light for the different species of plant, uh, which we do. But more importantly, it's, that's just one element to make sure that you can increase your yields. And to increase your yields, you need to control the environment that you're growing in. And if that is in vertical farming, or if it's in a glass house, or it's in a container or poly tunnel environment, you've got to be able to control that environment to make sure that you're getting the best yield out of what you're growing. And so we provide the technology, the sensor technology, going into that environment, which then pulls back the big data, all the technology, all the data going back to our lab. We've got a lab with scientists in who can recreate your environment wherever you are in the world so that we can then look at your environment and see what needs changing. And then we feed that data back. Now, some of our clients have got scientists already within uh, their companies and in growing environments, but others don't. They don't have that technology and don't have the know-how. Um, they're doing it in a very old fashioned way. Um, and so providing the data back to them with parameters, how much nutrient they might need, how much water, and this cuts down the wastage. And what we find with growers is that they've been doing things the same way for a long time, um, but they're still, you know, going out, testing the soil. What, what's the soil like going back, getting that data. This is live streaming data. So this is bringing all the data to them. So that might be CO2 levels. It might be nutrients. It might be how much heat it is, is in the building. It might be how much light there is in the building. It might be about disease of crop. Is the crop getting disease? And we can detect that as well. And so we bring all, all these elements together to create the recipe of that enclosed environment with the light, with the sensors, and it's streamed back to the lab or to them directly so that they can control the environment themselves to increase the yields. You mentioned disease, and I think um, you know the more I've, I've learned about the the industry and, and all the benefits. I, I think one of the things that's touted occasionally is organically grown and free from pesticides. And I think there's probably what you're what you're outlining here is that there there are different challenges that come up when you begin to grow in a controlled environment. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah. So different parts of the world have different status for organic. Um, we're finding um, parts of the world organic status is being given to vertical farms. Over in Europe, it, it's not as yet. I think it will we'll get there. Um, but it's all about, we, well, I think we're more conscious now of what we're eating, um, where it comes from, you know, how far has it traveled to your plate. And I think we've abandoned um, quite some time ago that we've been quite happy just to go to the, the supermarket, the mall, and, and, and buy our produce and having no idea where it comes from. And I think now we're conscious to see, well, how, where does it come from? The biggest thing that I've noticed in agriculture is the taste in food. If you grow, grow it locally, um, then the taste of the food, the produce is much better than if it traveled or it's had some preservative put on it so that it lasts longer. Um, you know, how much stuff travels via aircraft or by ship or by, by transport to get to your plate. Um, what we're trying to do is provide the technology so people can grow all year round and all our weather systems around the world are different and we're seeing weather change because of climate as well and seasons change. But how can we get so that you're controlling the weather from the point of view of your enclosed environment so you're growing all year round rather than buying in or in the off season? Um, you have the off seasons where you still got to fulfill your contracts. Um, how do you fulfill those contracts? Well, you can fulfill them with not actually importing, which is obviously creating a lot of CO2, but growing locally and all year round. And what we're looking at is producing where people are growing three or four yields 
a year is increasing them up to 15 to 18 yields a year by growing all year round. And that, that's the difference. Wow. Um, what did you see that was different in the world of vertical farming um, that resulted in, in a different company with light science? And as you were beginning to learn about vertical farming itself, controlled environment, agriculture, what were some of the uh, sort of things that were new that you had not known of previously in this industry and, and starting to learn as, as you were becoming more and more involved in it? I think in vertical farms, as you get more involved within them, you know, they, they're a big investment to, to put a vertical farm in from new with a big infrastructure and you obviously a, a big building in because obviously you're doing vertical. It's all about the tiers, how many tiers of farming that you've got. Um, so that you can grow in a smaller space. And what you're looking at is 100,000 square feet of factory space with the right eaves height um, will be the difference of 400 odd acres of land. So you're reducing the amount of land that you, you require so you can do it in a, in a smaller footprint. But the investment in technology infrastructure at the beginning it is quite an investment to do. Um, so what we find is that the, the lead times and being involved in these projects to delivery can be a number of years. So in vertical farms, in the new environment, they take a long time to establish as the historical polytunnels, glass houses, um, which are also doing vertical farm. You can do a vertical farm within the, an old infrastructure um, is much quicker. Um, and that's because the infrastructure's there. They haven't got to go out and find the land. They've already got it. They've generally got the, the building that it's going to go into because they're already growing in that environment, but they're making it in layers. So we find that different. So that's a learning curve. But I think the biggest thing is the education, is educating the historical growers, farmers in what they've done in the past to what they now need to do in the future using technology. We've all adapted to, you know, having mobile phones, the different apps that we get on our mobile phones and the technology being there. And, and it's the same. It's rather than having to go to the soil to test um, what's happening to your plants, you can be, um, you know, sitting on a beach if you really wanted to be, um, knowing where your crop is at, and then you can have it more automated. And if you do that, you can grow more. And what we try in one of our strap lines is grow more for less. And that's what we're trying to do. So grow more for less locally using our technology. As you started to develop relationships with vertical farms, did you find that it was more helpful to be involved early on in the process or where there were opportunities for retrofitting? I'm curious about the different stages of where companies are at and where they get the most benefit from partnering with Flight Science. I think the earlier that we're in uh, with the project, the more that we can support and partner with the customer. It's really important that if you're in at the beginning, there's no wasted time. You can bring your team in with their experts and work together as a team and with all their experience. Um, so there's no time wasted. Um, you can imagine if you've done 10, 20, 30 vertical farms in your time, you bring all that experience with you and that's what the team do. And so we have plant scientists who, you know, know how to grow different types of crop. And it does start at that. What are you trying to grow? How are you going to grow it is the really first important part because then you can establish what a sort of infrastructure that you need inside your building. We don't get involved in the infrastructure of the outside of the building, the shell of the building, but internally, that's the part we get involved in, in providing that technology in. So earlier, the better is the answer there. Um, and secondly, the, the, where we come into is there, you know, there's retrofits, energy. We all know energy is increasing and I think it will continue to do so. And obviously there's companies using lights to grow plants. But with LED products and technologies moved on from when LEDs, I first did my first project with LEDs, late 90s, um, they're changing so rapidly that the energy consumption, you don't need as many LEDs anymore. So using LEDs, you bring down as 
the consumption of energy that you need. And so the electricity supply that you need, so the cost is reduced. Um, so replacement of um, current lighting to LEDs, or even if they've got LED technology now, it's much better than it was. And so people are finding they're saving 30, 40% on their energy bills if they change those out. And so that's what we've, we've been helping them do. And we've got a great product which partners and is very environmentally friendly. Our lighting product is not only 90% recyclable, but also our unique selling point is that it's reusable. And so you buy our light, um, when it comes to the end of its life, you don't just throw it away and it gets recycled. You keep the body of the product and we change the innards. Um, so as we mentioned, UK Circuits, we, we've got our own electronics company. So we, we can build our own electronics, or, or put, pick and place the LEDs on the board, and we can slide the new electronics, the new net technology into the existing body of the product, which I think is really important that we start reusing what we've got, and especially in this particular type of environment. Um, and that tends to save the customer 30% the next time they come to replace their lights, um, which really is, is a no-brainer for, for the customer. And it keeps us, from a supplying point of view, a long-term partnership with our customers. We're there for the long term. We're not there to sell them one product and move on. We want to create a partnership for the long term. Can you talk a little bit to that? Because it's it's such an important topic nowadays, this idea of sustainability. And, and I'm sure it's also, you know, for some companies, the, the dirty or in the industry, the dirty little secret of the fact that some of these components probably do get thrown out and purchased anew. And you mentioned, obviously, you have the advantage of, of being connected with a, a rich history in UK circuits. So I'm wondering if you could speak a little, to, a little bit as to why this was an important decision for light science to be conscious of impact of these materials to the planet? I think we've become, you know, certain generations have become a throwaway society, um, which is, is disappointing, really. I think it's been too easy for us to acquire, purchase items, um, if they be electronic items um, or clothing or whatever it might be. Um, and then we've decided that we'll discard it. So the cost of, of acquiring clothing or electrical goods have keep reducing. And so then we don't see them as a, a 10 year item. And um, we see them, well, well, next year we might upgrade to the, to the, the next item, the better item. And I think, you know, marketing has taken us that way. There is always the, the next iPhone. There is always the next Xbox, the next PlayStation. There's always something better coming out. We've got to ask ourselves, why can't we be upgrading the software on the hardware that we buy, like we do with our computers, on some of these devices, rather than throwing away the electronics that you, you bought, the hardware that you've bought every year to, to get the upgrade. So uh, with our lighting and, you know, we, in agriculture itself produces about 30% of the world's emissions, um, which is worrying. Um, and so we have to change, you know, in England, we've just up in Scotland, we just had COP26 and we've had the world's leaders at COP26 and we have to change the way we're doing things and how we're growing our plants and how we're delivering our food around around the world and so when we talk to our customers and we talk to the general public the most important thing to them is food security so that's the first topic it is food security and then the second thing is sustainability um, of it all so you know where is it coming from how far has it traveled has it been in an aircraft and why has it been in an aircraft to get to us so we thought that we would make a range of products to suit 2021 and, you know, and going forward, have, have a range of products that we've got sustainability within them from day one. So we've produced a range of products and been very careful about how we design our products so that they can all be reused and upgraded. So with our sensor technology to get upgrades, you know, you've only got to apply through them through software rather than changing the hardware. And then when they do come to the end of life, as I mentioned, the lighting, keep the body of the product and change the innards. 
But with our sensor technology, we will have them back and we'll recycle those so that they can be used again. And, and I think everything needs to be, you know, we should all be thinking that way now. And I know around the world in different countries that is starting to happen. Um, and I think that's really important. You know, the new next generation um, need to be driving as well as we, the older generation, need to be driving that cause if we want to stop our planet heating up. Yeah, very excellent point. You may have touched on, on this, again, related to UK circuits, but how do you identify what, what's some of the distinguishing characteristics of what you provide at, at Light Science that may be different from than what some of the competitors are doing? I think our, our big difference between our, our competitors, we, we, there's a lot of uh, large organizations leading um, the lighting part of, uh, of producing lighting in agriculture and providing a, a recipe of light. And their traditional lighting manufacturers who have come into the market, who've seen an opportunity in a market, in a growing market. Um, but they're selling a brown box, as we would call it, selling a, a product into the industry. They want to sell you as many products as possible to you. And then they want to walk away and they go to the next customer. Um, that's not a, a relationship or a partnership that, you know, they're not thinking about being green or environmentally friendly. Um, our part we play is we, we don't just provide you with the hardware. We provide you with the relationship permanently because we want to look at replacing the light, the sensor, when it comes to the end of its life, if it be in five years, 10 years time. And so we're looking at long-term contracts, creating that partnership. So we're not going anywhere. We were there to stay. We're warranting our, our products for five years or more on some of the things. And so creating that long-term partnership, providing the hardware, but everybody go, well, how can you prove it? Well, we have our own scientific labs where we've got our own scientists with our own grown rooms, and we can actually prove and you can trial this before you buy. Um, so you can come along and you, you might have a new seed that you want to try or a new nutrient you want to try, or you might have a new lighting product, which is somebody else's and it might not be ours, um, but you can go and try it and compare our lighting product or our sensor product within our lab and try your new nutrient and you can test it before you put it in your own environment. And so we have that capability and a lot of our competitors don't have our scientists and the, the lab to be able to do that. Um, but also what we do with all our technology, we're bringing it together. So you've got big data, AI coming out of this. So the lights and the sensors and the whole environment and the lab are all talking to each other. And then on your handheld device, you're providing that information back so that they know how much water or if there's too much sunlight because the plant is just about to flower, which they don't want to happen. So you're suddenly having been in control of what's going to happen before it happens. And that's what AI is about. It's about starting to predict what's going to happen in the future. And so a lot of our competitors, you know, are selling a lighting product. They've got others are just doing lab work. Others are just doing sensory work. We've got all of those in one, under one roof where we manufacture our product, we design our own product, uh, but we create that long-term partnership with you. We're there for the next 20, 30, 40 years um, of being in that, that partnership with you. And that's what really makes us stand out from all our competitors and the uniqueness of our products and being reusable and recyclable. That's a very important distinction. Thank you for pointing that out. I'm wondering, as I think about some of the issues that companies have experienced firsthand, whether they were ready or not with supply chain, <laughs> you know, having just as, as we come out or go back into <laughs> the pandemic, I'm not sure where we're at <laughs> at this point. It's hard to keep up. We're just about to be back in, I think. <laughs> so how has that been for you when you think about that? Because I imagine there are a lot of components that go into the technology that you create. And uh, if you could speak to that or any other of the barriers you faced. Yeah, so in the electronic side of UK circuits, there's definitely been a component shortages around the world. So you're finding that stock levels are increasing within our own company to support our customers' requirements. We even sold components back to China 
in recent months, which is, is unusual. We're normally buying from around the world to, uh, to produce our own products. So we have seen a shift. We do see a shift in more manufacturing in our own country rather than, than importing. And that might be down to, you know, how difficult it is now to import goods and tariffs will increase and transporters increase um, in price over the COVID period. So I think we've all seen increases in prices, if it be um, when you go and buy in the shops or, or components or all components you might buy for your products. Um, so we've definitely seen that that happen. So you have to be, I think with our experience and our designs, you have to look at designing the product and designing that component out and using a different component, which is available to put into your, into your product. And I think you have to be quick thinking on your feet and work that out. Lead times on some components can be now over a year. And so wow. designing, yeah, designing that particular component out and designing a new one in is, is really what the, you know, the company is very, being very clever about doing. From a light science technologies point of view, what we try and do is make our, our products out of 11 core materials and then we stock those materials and what we can then do is make up the units of different sizes in-house because we manufacture in-house rather than subcontracting out we have more control um, so we've brought more materials in which makes our range of products out of those 11 core materials we can then build the products that our clients are looking for um, which I think has been really important to, and been quite clever in how we go about our designing our products in the first place um, with the sustainability with it as well. Yeah, that definitely sounds like a, a very smart approach to limit it. If you know that you have those 11 materials, then obviously it behooves you to make sure you have ample supply of those on hand. So that's a really, really smart approach. So talk a little bit about the future, what you have planned, what's on the roadmap to the extent that you can share what the next year looks like for light, light science? Well, we, we went public on the London Stock Exchange in October. And with the funds that we raised by going public, um, we are expanding further into Europe. Um, but also we, we're now doing quotes for growers and farmers and investors around the world. Um, we're doing one actually in America at the moment. And so we've had quite a lot of demand, even though we're not pushing our product over there, um, we're finding that there's a bigger demand for our product range and our products. And so we're starting to get that audience uh, more globally. And so we're using uh, money that we gained uh, from listing on the stock exchange to grow our product range, um, to further our technologies in AI and big data, uh, which we, we see as the future. Um, but we've also, behind the scenes, producing a system for um, traditional farming um, from the point of view of glass houses and polytunnels to make their environments easier to grow in more year, all year round, and which has been quite difficult in the past and being more automated. Um, what we find is, especially in Europe, there's been a big labor shortage. And so be able to be more automated by using certain technologies and equipment where you're, you can seed your ground, you can plow um, your ground, you can actually harvest your ground using certain types of equipment rather than people picking or using tractors to go up and down in the field. What we're finding is you're great gaining more space uh, because tractor tires um, going up and down, you can't grow in those tractor tires. So if you could take away the tractor, um, but you still can do the same job of harvesting, plowing, and seeding your, your, your ground, um, you gain up to over 20% of your ground back from those tractor tires being lost. And so in that side of things, we're finding you know, a big demand for, for that um, coming forward. So that's new technology, which is coming out, and you'll hear a bit more about that in the second half of, of next year. Um, but also, you know, the sensor technology comes out in the first half of next year um, where we're starting to use that AI data, um, which is, is really, I think, is the key to our growing success. Sounds very exciting. And I'm sure as 
most of as these developments actually start to come online, people can probably learn more on the website. I would imagine. Actually, yeah, can please go to, go to our website and have a look at Light Science Technologies. And a couple of questions as we wrap up. What's a, a tough question you've had to ask yourself lately? <laughs> tough question recently. It's a good question in itself. I think um, some of the tough questions coming out is, you know, how do we make the company more sustainable? You know, we're very conscious because of, of COP26 being held in the UK, we're very conscious of that. So how can we make a company more sustainable, more environmentally friendly? Um, how can we uh, grow globally and do that efficiently? Those are the, the, the tough questions. And employment is, is difficult as well. Um, you know, making sure that you're employing the right individuals and they're available. You know, people, we've got now people working from us who've come from all over, over the world, from Brazil, to Brunei, you know, we've got all sorts of, uh, of people now coming globally to come and work for us and um, making sure that all of those cultures fit into our business and that we're a rounded business. I think that's really ethically, it's really important that we're, we're a rounded business if we're going to grow into this global company and be part of the global what's going on in the world in this key marketplace is that we, we, you know, we, we can do that with the right individuals coming from around the world to create our company. Yeah, that's an interesting outcome of the pandemic is companies were forced to rethink what the importance of having people in on site and then pushing to the limits of what's capable and what you're possible of doing remotely. Um, I was hearing of like remote tours and, and remote walkthroughs and, and people were getting more and more creative. And now to your point, um, opening it up and seeing that you do have that flexibility of a remote workforce, while that is a benefit, it's an interesting point you brought up. You're also, because you're global, introducing new cultures into your environment and that becomes its own set of challenges, which I'm sure has been interesting. Yeah, and I think it's, it's really, you know, technology and using video conferencing, as much as it was, uh, you know, been around for, for some time, without being, it's right, educating ourselves, we were forced to educate ourselves into using it. And that's been a good thing. And that's the same in agriculture, using the technology that we're providing. It's education. Um, and it's good for traditional farmers, as well as it is to the new vertical farmers, um, you know, don't get left behind, join it now. You know, it's important for us all to embrace technology and to use it where it's, it's fit to do so. Speaking of, of not getting left behind, I'm curious, what's something you've changed your mind about recently? What have I changed my mind about recently? I think, you know, moving more into, I didn't know if I was going to, in our country, we, we, we're moving away from fossil driven cars. Uh, fueled cars um, into electric cars. And I wondered when I would go and into acquiring an electric car and when that might, might be. And I think I've changed my mind that it will be earlier um, than I probably thought it might be. You know, I think we all get a bit set in our ways and get used to things and, you know, you have to try something new. So I think really that's been one of the, one of the things that, um, is pushing me to, to move into acquiring an electric car a lot rather than a kind of a fossil fuel good car. Yeah, years ago, probably 10 to 15, maybe I, I tested out the Nissan Leaf and then I, I for a while, ha I've had a Toyota Prius hybrid, but they're interesting to drive and I, I don't have it anymore. But it is, it's almost like we're, because of some of the car companies mandating that they will be out of <laughs> gas vehicles. I think it's, uh, to your point, behooves us all to, to start to, to realize, you know, what we do enjoy. Uh, my partner loves the feel of a stick shift. So her car is actually <laughs> a manual. So I, I think it'll almost be a collector's item at some point, a gas vehicle. I think it will be a big piece of art isn't it, on our driveways or wherever we decide to put them. But I think that's, you know, another thing which is changing and we have to embrace. Yeah, as long as the infrastructure is there, I think we're in this transition period globally where the infrastructure has got to be there and the mileage, um, you'll, you'll be able to do the kilometers or the miles are available to do under one charge rather than having to 
constantly keep charging a vehicle and the charging just becomes quicker. Yeah, you start to see some of these, uh, the, the highways being built with the charging strips in them, which is fascinating technology in and of itself. <laughs> Yeah, we haven't got that over here yet, but I, I have seen that on the internet and uh, I'll be looking forward to seeing where that goes. But that's, a, that's really different and, and exciting. I don't know if they'd be able to pull it off on, a, on somewhere like the Autobahn. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'd uh, be interested to see if they can uh, do the speedings and, and, and be able to charge for both at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Well, Simon, I appreciate you taking the time to join me on this conversation. We had a couple of challenges technology-wise, <laughs> which we were able to work out. So I, I appreciate you being flexible with that and for sharing your story and uh, the interesting work you're doing at Light Science. What I think is fascinating is how you've been able to take all this experience from UK circuits and now apply it to what you're doing at, at Light Science in a way that does you know, really seem to give you a competitive edge in terms of what you're doing and how you differentiate yourself from your competitors. And also it's very admirable to see what you're doing on the sustainability front, because it's something that I think that needs to talk about more. So on all fronts, uh, thank you for your time. No, thank you, Barry, for, for inviting me. It's been a, been a joy to talk to you and experience and go through our experience as we grow. We're, we're very excited about, about the future and moving forward. And uh, it's a great market to be in and we're, we're thrilled to be part of it. And so for more information, we'll have all the links mentioned in the show notes and the website is lightsciencetech.com. Anywhere else uh, to direct folks? No, that, that's the place to go. Lightsciencetech.com is, is the place to go. Okay. Thanks again for your time, Simon. Thanks, Harry. Thank you. Bye-bye. So thanks to Simon for sharing his story. As always, full show notes are available at verticalfarmingpodcast.com. We're also looking to update the site with PDF transcriptions of these conversations as well. So again, if you have any questions, I'm always available at harry at verticalfarmingpodcast.com. We've got some great plans in store for season five, including growing our community and restarting our newsletter as well. Special thanks to our season four platinum sponsor, Cultivated. If you're looking into a vertical farm and don't know where to start or which technology would suit your needs, reach out to them today. Best of all, their service is free because they work on behalf of their partners. Learn more at cultivated.com, and that's spelled C-U-L-T-I-V-A-T-D.com. Just leave out that last E. And an additional note of congratulations to the team for completing their $3 million Series A round. Nice job, guys. Podcast production and marketing provided by Fullcast. If you're interested in learning more about how a podcast could be helpful for your business, sign up for a free podcast brainstorm at fullcast.co. And as a reminder, if you're enjoying the show, please leave us a rating and a review at ratethispodcast.com forward slash VFP. And yes, we will be sure to read those out on future episodes. Head strong into the end of the new year as we realize that people are looking for content to listen to over the holidays. So that's why we're staying consistent with our production next week. We have a great conversation with Scott Bryson of Orbital Forum. Hope you're enjoying the holidays with your family. I'm grateful to each and every one of you for listening in every week and for sharing the podcast with your friends and neighbors and other folks in the vertical farming space. Until we meet again, here's to your health. Thanks for listening. To read the full show notes for this episode, which includes any links mentioned in the episode, as well as a full show transcription, visit verticalfarmingpodcast.com. There, you can sign up for our email list to be notified when new episodes are published.